Welcome, ladies and gents. Chris Andre here. You can find me at Pet Boxing on Twitter for boxing related tweets, or you can subscribe to the channel, click that notifications button, and get a new notification whenever a new video is uploaded. We've got a whole bunch of topics to talk about tonight. Let's start off with Joe Joyce really quickly. Um, one of the things I didn't say, uh, because a few of you have said Chris is getting hit with telegraphed shots. He's, you know, these big guys are going to spark him out. He's too, too robotic. Here's the thing, right? He, I understand. I do get it. Takam's 40 years old. Joe Dress was 9-1 to one on favourite. You, you know, a lot of people expected him. The bookies certainly expected him to walk straight through to Carlos Takam. As I explained in the post-fight video, um, I knew it would be competitive. But you have to understand something. A lot of people that are saying he shouldn't be getting hit as much. You have to try and understand the dynamic of what it is exactly that Joe is trying to do. Okay. If Joe was to be more defensively responsible, because when he's in that defensive mindset, he's actually all right defensively. He's got very good feet and he's got good upper body movement. This is a dude that does backflips in the ring after fights, right? He's an agile guy. And you'll see him leaning away, catching shots on the outside of the shoulder. He's almost turning away completely and leaning back. And he does these sorts of things when he's in that defensive mindset and he can be defensively sound. But the thing is, Joe Joyce's hands are slow. And although he's very, very heavy handed, he doesn't, because he's so slow, he cannot load up on shots. He's not going to catch you with a leaping left hook. He's not going to sit there and catch you with a shot that you don't see coming, that's sneaky, that's just going to clean your clock in one go. So he has to wear you down. Because if he doesn't wear you down, and it's a technical sort of chess match, and he's not really getting hit much, he's not landing as much on you as a result, uh, and you're able to you know, survive for long periods of time and stuff like that, and then it gets into the latter stages. The fight gets into the latter stages. And when you get into the latter stages, the guy's still fresh. And it's nip and tuck because it's been a cagey fight. Now you have to put your foot on the gas. But he's got a hand speed advantage. The fight could get away from you. So what he does is he uses his feet to put himself in a position where you are forced to confront him as an obstacle. In other words... Do you run even more quickly backwards to try and maintain the range? If you do, you could end up looking a little bit like Matthew Macklin against Golovkin. And we'll talk about that in a moment because it's relevant here. Alternatively, you can try and punch back. And if you try and punch back, you better make sure you stop, you halt his forward momentum. So how do you do that? Is it just a scoring shot and then move? That's what I would suggest to do. But most fighters struggle to even do that because he is fast afoot and he's so big. So they have to put more on the shot. And they're landing big shots on Joe. And he's just an obstacle that keeps coming forward. And an, Im an immovable object, seemingly. So by putting himself into a position where you're forced to hit him, you're forced to wear yourself down. You know, in like uh, those computer games like Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat, you've got that energy bar at the top. And every time a guy hits you, you lose a little bit of that energy bar. And then when the all the energy's gone, your fighter's knocked out and he loses. Well, in real life, it's not just being hit that deducts from that energy bar. In real life, it's also that constant movement. Your stamina starts to wane. It takes its toll on you, these constant herky-jerky, high-energy expending movements. Now, Gennady Golovkin will cover up his cheekbones and he'll walk across, cut off the ring and walk into range. And he's offering you just the top of his skull, the hardest part of the body, he tucks his chin, the hardest part of the skull, sorry. He tucks his chin, the elbow's the hardest bone in the body, so he makes sure he curves his back quite a lot to protect those ribs. You can potentially hit an elbow, you can hit a lot of forearms, you can hit the forehead. And the minute you decide to throw and you finish throwing, he'll then throw directly after you and he'll land these powerful hooks to the head and to the body. And he wears you down. Well, Joe Joyce does a similar thing in that regard. Okay, Joe Golovkin doesn't have to do that. He can get on the back foot. He can out jab you, the statistically most accurate jab in the sport. Joe's also got a brilliant jab, by the way. And what he tends to do is use that jab because that's a one punch he's got, which is fast and is, you know, it, it's quick enough to be able to dictate with it. But the other power shots, he really needs you to punch first so you're in range so he can then land, so he can punch with you. Or he wears down your energy bar before he really lets those hands go. So it's part of his game to say, I'll take a shot to make sure I give off a shot. And a lot of people say, yeah, but that means you're just reliant on his chin. If you take away his chin, he's not the same fighter. But it's a physical attribute. If you take away another fighter's hand speed, he might not be the same fighter. If you take away his punch and power, he might not be the same fighter. The fact of the matter is, Joe Joyce is a big, strong, physically imposing man with a skull like a damn 
I don't know what it is, but that skull, I guarantee you, that skull's so thick, he could block radiation from that brain with that skull. He's just a big man. He's like punching a giant, a Nephilim or something. He just keeps coming. And that's part of his game, to create that high tempo. So he has to, in some regards, disperse of this concept of I'm not going to get hit. He wants to put you under that pressure whereby, yes, you're forced to hit, you're forced to exert shots. Now, yes, ideally, he would block more punches, but then his hands would have to come higher up. And it would also change what he then gives out as he's moving forward. I personally would like to see him study George Foreman a little bit more in terms of the body manipulation of opponents, the way he could literally grab shoulders and move them in exchanges to stop them throwing punches and change angles on them. I'll put a video uh, as the end screen video um, at the end of this video, which basically was the breakdown I did of a fantasy fight between uh, Holyfield, sorry, did I say Holyfield? I meant George Foreman, between Foreman and uh, Mike Tyson. And you can check that video out and you could see some of the subtle things that I speak about that George Foreman used to do. And I'd like to see Joe Dress bring some of that into his game. But generally speaking, it suits him to fight the way he does. Will it carry? Will it work against the biggest punches in the division? Who knows? But so far, it's working very well for him. Now, moving on from that, listen, I'm delighted to see that the viewership has gone up again on this channel. I'm so grateful to you guys genuinely for conversing with me, debating with me, taking the time to watch the videos. You genuinely do enrich my boxing experience, and I'm genuinely grateful to each and every one of you. Whenever I talk about the topic I'm going to talk about now, the viewer count suffers considerably, and I get uh, subscribers tell me, Chris, we're not getting any more notifications. I have to specifically go to your channel to see the videos and so on and so forth. And so from a selfish perspective, I would think to myself, you know what, I don't want to discuss this topic anymore. And ideally, I wouldn't want to discuss this topic anymore. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, just stick to boxing, man. What are you talking about? Don't talk about these other things. The thing is, though, this other topic that I'm going to discuss now directly impacts on the sport of boxing. And we could see some choices that are being made by the government directly impact on the sport to the extent whereby top level fighters as well as journeymen who are the cogs in the world that make the sport tick could walk away from the sport now i'm going to speak in code so that i don't trigger those algorithms i would ask you please to use the same terminology that i use so that we do not trigger this algorithm if anybody does use the official term uh, I will remove the, the, the comment just because, like I said, I don't want the channel to suffer. So it'll be nothing personal. Please use the terminology that I use. So I'm going to plagiarize from Hatman a little bit and call it the postman's knock. For those of you that might not know that have not seen Hatman's video, have a little look at the screen now and you'll understand exactly what the postman's knock is. OK, now Bojo has decided that if you haven't that those that have the postman's knock on two occasions will be allowed to attend large gatherings and sporting events otherwise you will not be allowed to attend i'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of this and the science of it but i promise you this is unscientific if you believe that the product provides you with the protection that you need then it's irrelevant whether somebody else has also had the product because you are protected which makes the product obsolete if you do not believe that the product does what it says on the tin then it should be irrelevant whether somebody else gets it because again it makes the product obsolete so what is the point the fact of the matter is it is said to protect you against something with an already minuscule uh, percentage of mortality so as a result of that if it's further significantly reduced, like they claim, then you should have nothing to worry about because what you pass on is only relevant if what you pass on is inherently deadly. Nobody is concerned with passing on something that is not deadly, such as the common cold. So as a result of this, scientifically, it makes absolutely no sense, particularly when it doesn't stop you, the postman's knock, from catching or distributing this particular thing that it said to protect you against. Now, moving on from that, regardless of that, we're not going to get into the science of it here. However, a bunch of fighters, a plethora of fighters, former fighters, pundits and trainers, internationally renowned, are against taking this thing. By now, if you have taken it, you have made a choice about your health. That's fine. If you haven't taken it, you've probably also made the choice about your health at this stage. So, Whatever happened to respecting those choices? Now, you've got people like Josh Taylor, who have said they will not take it. Sonny Edwards, world champion, fantastic fighter. I'm a massive fan of Sonny's. He will not take it. Anthony Fowler has said he will not take it. You've also, I've also been reliably informed by somebody who's a massive Alexander Usyk fan. 
that Alexander Usyk is uh, quite a staunch Orthodox Christian, and I was aware of this myself. I've seen him um, praying in front of Orthodox icons and stuff like that. I've seen if you follow his Instagram, you'll know this. But this person who's a massive uh, Usyk fan also informed me that he goes to a specific monastery quite regularly whereby they believe that everything that is happening in the world at the moment and the postman's knock is something that is part of biblical prophecy. And as a result, they will not be taking under any circumstances, and I mean any circumstances to the point where of they prefer to die, than take the postman's knock. And apparently Alexander Usyk frequents this monastery. Now his best friend is, and his best man is Lomachenko, who is said to share the same faith. So this is speculative, but it could very well be that they are uh, men of faith who would not take this because of religious purposes. And there will be many people around the world who will want a religious, who for religious reasons will not want to take the postman's knock. Now, additionally to that, you've also got Tiafimo Lopez, who's been criticized by um, Bob Arum for not taking it. You've also got the likes of Terence Crawford, who, although I haven't seen him speak about this specific thing, in general, if you're talking about the general measures and everything that revolves around this, he was also not abiding. He did not believe that the mask offers anything, and he believed that the, and he was criticized by major news outlets for this, and he believed that the mask, although he relented on that, he has not relented, perhaps, on something like this, which, if he doesn't believe in the general narrative, he might not take this product, this postman's knock, uh, if he doesn't believe the general narrative, right? So now let's talk about some of the names that I've mentioned here. Josh Taylor, Alexander Usyk, Vasil Lomachenko, Tiafimo Lopez, Terence Crawford. Well, now you're talking about five of the top 10 pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world. Sonny Edwards, a superb champion. Anthony Fowler, a guy who was a very decorated amateur. His career stagnated somewhat after that loss to Fitzgerald. But like I said, he's skilled, he's a decorated amateur. He looks superb in his last outing. He's the sort of guy who's a great character as well. A lot of people love him. A lot of people hate him. I'm on the, I'm uh, very much on the, the the bandwagon of people that really like Anthony Fowler. I think he's a great character. Um, Dave Coldwell, fantastic trainer. Carl Froch, former legend, of, well, current legend, but I mean former fighter of uh, one of the best, I guess, that this country's ever produced. He's spoken about this, right? All these people, trainers, pundits, fighters. Steve Goodwin, when I was on his show debating this very issue a long time ago, uh, he spoke about the fact prior to me going on that show, the episode before, he spoke about the fact that he told one of his fighters who said he didn't want it, that he would have to face never fighting again, therefore. So this just tells you that there are a lot of journeyman type fighters as well who are the cogs of the will of the sport, who make the sport possible, who are not willing to get it. So we are seeing a situation here where some of the biggest names in the sport, because there'll be a whole lot more who have yet to show their hand on this, believe that, could walk away. It makes no sense scientifically, and it's going to destroy the sport and multiple aspects of society, the very fabric of society. The entire sport needs to come together and stand by it. As Sonny Edwards tonight has tweeted, speaking about how a family member of his has had both the postman's knock and uh, is in currently in hospital um, so you can see that these sorts of people are not going to relent. They're not going to take it. So what do you do? Ban them? Because what? They're not putting you in increased danger. So anyway, moving on from that, the sport at the moment is, there's an existential threat to the sport and to liberty at the moment. I just want to say that. Now, moving on from that, let's talk about Manny Pacquiao. Manny has said that his body is rested and he's raring to go. He said that he's basically feeling in great uh, shape that his his energy levels and his energy stores are overflowing after two years out of the ring and it allowed his body to rest and Freddie Roach is very proud of him he says listen he never gets old it feels like he'll never get old um, and he's so proud of him and he feels that the best is yet to come from Manny Pacquiao now here's the thing do you believe that Manny Pacquiao is correct in his assessment here do you think that the long layoff because this can happen that a long layoff can help the body recuperate, particularly at that age. And as a result, I don't expect us to see a young Manny Pacquiao, but can we expect to see the same Manny Pacquiao that fought Keith Thurman, that level of energy, that level of athleticism? Or is it a case of a long layoff of a fighter of his age actually having a detrimental effect? Let me know what you think on this. I really don't know. It could be a scenario whereby... You know, he genuinely does need to recover fully and he's, he's able to after that long layoff. Um, but nonetheless... You could still see a situation whereby those sorts of fighters that are reliant on that athleticism just get old overnight, 
right? So let me know what you think about that with regards to Manny Pacquiao. And talking about long layoffs, uh, Malik Scott, the trainer of Deontay Wilder, has basically said that he feels that the layoff is actually going to suit Wilder even more than Tyson Fury. Uh, a lot more than Fury. He says it will enable him to marinate Fury even more. Let me know what you think about this. Do you think there's that uh, Malik Scott is correct? I know we've discussed this in the past because Wilder will have longer to work on certain things. So it's bound to suit him more, right? But do you also think it will have a negative impact on Fury having to continue to wait out? He has been inactive for a long time. So has Wilder. Uh, but like I've said in the past, Fury's style is reliant more on reflexes and they need to be sharp. So is this a case of a guy who's not in shape, who's not living the lifestyle, and he's going to end up paying the price? I'm not really asking so much about the outcome, although you're more than welcome to tell me what you think the outcome will be. I'm simply asking, do you think the longer it goes, these postponements, the more it suits Wilder? Or do you think that there's never been a better time to find an excuse to postpone a fight with everything going on in the world? So as a result, Fury's using that excuse because he's in such terrible shape. And if the rumors are true and he was struggling against the likes of Jared Anderson in sparring, this gives him more time to work on things and as a result improves his chances. Let me know what you think about that. Um, something a little bit out of left field, Fedor Emelianenko, one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time. Uh, arguably the greatest heavyweight, the best heavyweight. It's hard to talk about greatness. Greatness is more about status. But if you're talking about ability, this guy was unbelievable. Fedor Emelianenko, old-time MMA fans will know exactly what I'm talking about, is looking to fight Roy Jones Jr. in an exhibition clash, a boxing fight. Um, unbelievable that would be to see as a spectacle. They're way past their best. We know this. But, um, you know, it's kind of like those wrestling things that I've spoken about before, those analogies, you know. If Hulk Hogan was to come out of retirement to fight The Rock or Ric Flair was to come back and fight Stone Cold Steve Austin and all that. All the wrestling fans, all those that watched it as children, they'll be up on their feet cheering away even though you know they're not capable of the athleticism they were once capable of. So that's a, that captures my imagination a lot more than the sort of YouTube stuff. Um, another thing, Eddie Hall, talking of these sort of uh, gimmick fights, Eddie Hall, the world's strongest man, was going to fight Thor Bjornsson, another one of the world's strongest men. He ripped a, a bicep now i've made my position clear on this in the past although neither one is going to be defensively blessed based on the fact that they're just not going to have the reflexes and the the know-how to roll with punches and stuff like that so if either one lands flush on the other they're more than capable of knocking the other one out but despite that from the things i've seen i've been impressed with um uh thor i think bjornsson for a man of his size who's a novice does some really good things he actually moves very well for a man of his size um whereas uh, you know Hall, to me, looks like a complete novice. So I would have been back in Thor. I believe he would have won the fight. And with a, a bicep injury, the fight's been postponed. These are injuries that can play a big role in, in your career as a fighter in general, particularly if you've got tight biceps. It, can, it is an injury that can come back and can affect you. So um, this is going to further hinder his hopes, even in a comeback fight, in my opinion. Now, quickly talking about Anthony Joshua, a lot of people have spoken about uh, Anthony Joshua's comments that Usyk is a good fighter and he's better than Tyson Fury. He's a bigger test than Fury. A lot of people have been instantly laughed that off. Listen, let me just tell you this. If you're talking about skill set, Alexander Usyk is elite. Okay, He's as good, if not arguably better as a cruiserweight than any of the heavyweights are heavyweights. Right? He's elite. The question is, can he carry that to the heavyweight division? A lot of people have said he's not impressed me at all so far. He didn't impress me against um, Chaz Witherspoon. He didn't impress me against Derek Chisora and so on and so forth. Here's the thing. how you Whether you are impressed or not is irrelevant as to whether somebody ever looked like they were going to lose the fight. He won comfortably against Witherspoon. He didn't look spectacular, but he won comfortably against Chisora. I feel as though, you know, first impressions, they really count. And if you ever approach a woman, say, in the street and you try, or wherever, under a bar, wherever it might be, if you approach her in a method that is cringy, classless, insulting, whatever it might be, and her first impression of you is that you're an idiot, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to salvage that and to change her mind, right? Whereas if, you're, if the first impression is very, very good, if you then, further down the line in the conversation, you make some sort of joke that doesn't go down too well, she might shrug it off and think, all right, he made a stupid comment, but we'll leave it at that. And then you can still end up doing quite well. And but she can agree to go on a date and so on and so forth. The point is that first impression, and this is in all aspects of life, is vital. 
And I believe that that whole process, that thought process, translated to the Usyk Chisora fight. What I want you to do, if you've got the time, if you can be bothered, come and watch the Usyk Chisora fight again. But this time, don't watch the first two rounds. Start watching from the start of round three and score the first two rounds to Chisora. 2-0 to Chisora and watch it from there. And I believe you will not think that the fight was particularly close on the scorecards. I don't buy into this, that it could have been a draw or it could have gone either way. Usyk won the fight comfortably on the scorecards. Now, in the first two rounds, Usyk looked very uncomfortable. And Derek Chisora has very fast feet. He's frenetic and incessant in his tempo and his assault. And as a result, he put real pressure on Usyk, whose construct was broken. He really did not look comfortable. And Chisora is a nightmare to fight early on because he comes at you, this big, wide uh, specimen of a man, and he throws wide, powerful uh, shots. And when you're looking to try and read that pattern and the trajectory of his shots can slip off to the outside, because he's covering such a wide range on the outside, it's hard. It's going to take you a period to get used to that. And that's what Usyk struggled with. So this idea that Usyk struggled against Chisora and as a result of that, he's nowhere near the League of Fury or he's nowhere near the League of Anthony Joshua, they're different style of fighters to Chisora. Just because he might have had some issues early in the fight against him doesn't mean he would against them. And by the same token, how badly did Usyk actually do against Chisora? Didn't he do better than than Joseph Parker? Didn't he do better than Dillian White? I know the second fight, Dillian White knocked Chisora out, but... He had some scary moments in both fights. At no point did Usyk ever look like he was on the verge of going or that Chisora had really gotten on top of him and he was going to win the fight. Those first two rounds, he looked very uncomfortable, did Usyk. But that was it. And so this idea that Usyk's somehow out of his depth, I just can't see it. So it is very possible. I'm not saying it's going to happen. It might not. But it's very possible that Usyk beats AJ and beats Tyson Fury. Don't be stunned if that happens. I'm not saying it's going to. It might not. But this is a very real test. And it's not some ridiculous statement, even though I'm sure he meant it as a dig to Tyson Fury. It's not a ridiculous statement. These are two elite level heavyweights fighting each other. And there's, of course, another two or three elite level heavyweights. It's the beauty of boxing. But don't laugh off Alexander Usyk. Um, finally, Murat Gassiev said he wants to be out again in two or three months after his fight against Volish. That's good to hear. We want to see these guys be active. The division, in my humble opinion, is absolutely stacked. There's so much talent in it. We just need to see these guys start fighting each other. Thank you for watching, everybody. Please let me know um, your opinion on all of the things that we've spoken about in this particular video. Like I said, if you're going to comment on the postman's knock, by the way, one more thing I forgot to mention. Kovalev is another one who goes to a couple of these monasteries um, whereby he may see it as a religious duty not to take this specific uh, postman's knock. So again, another massive name in the sport, albeit in the twilight of his career. So this is just speculation, but who knows how these guys are going to act when the time comes. If you're going to speak about this, please use the term postman's knock, um, product, things like that, you know. The V instead of the actual illness, you know, be careful with how you, in fact, don't even use the V, use something else. Say, say the illness, if you're going to talk about it, please try not to trigger the algorithms. Thanks for watching, everybody. Chat to you soon. Please hit that like button, subscribe button, notifications button. Take care. God bless. Chat to you soon.